So uh, this is the agenda. We'll, uh, we'll talk about briefly about uh, hypervisor-based isolation, what protections those provide against kind of malicious software, malicious devices, and so on, or compromised devices. Uh, we'll talk about uh, kind of uh, this nasty thing that we call uh, from a rootkit and how hypervisors are good at protecting gates from a rootkit. Uh, we'll also talk about how that, that rootkit could be installed as well as the vulnerabilities that we use um, to install the firmware rootkit or to compromise hypervisor from within the virtual machines. Uh, and uh, we'll conclude with uh, some of the mitigations available there, with tools that we're, we'll be uh, releasing soon, uh, open source. So with that, uh, you know, hypervisor-based isolation. It's good when it's done, when it's complete. And with that, I'm switching to Alex. He'll, uh, he'll actually explain what it is. So usually hypervisor's isolation working uh, with some, if we have malicious virtual machine, it's infected by some malware or compromised by some exploit. Uh, Closer or take it. Okay. So. Okay. Так. So. Good. Um, if you have some compromised virtual machine and uh, by some malicious software or some exploit, it's usually uh, protected by hypervisor to not affect the others' virtual machines into cloud or uh, some machine. And uh, also, hypervisor protect uh, uh, from uh, attacks from the malicious hardware. Uh, it's mean uh, some VTD attacks based on DMA. Or, or, or something like uh, option ROM, something like that. So, and um, uh, usually uh, hypervisor developers not uh, directly thinking about uh, uh, firmware isolation. And we will show in our presentation how, uh, how system firmware can affect uh, uh, a lot of different hypervisors. So, and um, it's some description of different technologies based on uh, hypervisor isolation. So uh, usually the memory protects and uh, hypervisors uh, dispatch VM access and uh, isolated uh, uh, direct hardware access uh, for uh, read EMUSRs, IO permissions uh, by bitmaps, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, memory. Uh, protected by uh, EPT and controlling from hypervisor level and it's software, uh, usually it's software based isolation. And uh, also uh, a lot of hypervisors have device level isolation which based on some interruptor mapping or uh, IOMMU uh, for uh, which are protected by VTD also for uh, DMA attacks. But um, so we will uh, look at how uh, uh, from firmware it's it looks in different uh, different uh, um, vision. So uh, it's a little bit uh, description about the how uh, this technology for of isolation worked. So uh, usually uh, all uh, configuration about hypervisor uh, about virtual machine stored in VM control structure in Intel it's VMCS and um, it's control all uh, interrupt execution or instruction exceptions um, and uh, also uh, we have MSR bitmaps which isolate uh, direct access to read write, write MSRs from uh, guests or um, uh, EPT pages which um, uh, which uh, usually uh, software based isolation and uh, IO bitmaps which controlling uh, direct IO access to the devices and uh, here is a uh, B2 it's uh, SM, software SMI uh, interrupt and we will show uh, on the next slides how we can apply SMI handlers attack against hypervisors for compromise this protection and we will show uh, how we can um, compromise EPT pages protection by uh, S3 boot script attack vector. Uh, it's not new, uh, new, not new exploit but 
uh, it's already show on uh, Hayes Communication Congress in this year, in the last year on the end of the last year by Corey and uh, and Rafael from Bromium and Legbacor, Corey from Legbacor. So, but we uh, found some interesting way to uh, to compromise hypervisors uh, by this vector. It's not. Uh, it's not showing uh, before, just on last black hat <laughs> this week. So, and system firmware level isolation, it's really important. And if you control uh, the system firmware, you can, uh, you, you can access to direct to the physical memory and control everything on the system. It's not mean uh, if you control the firmware on some device, it's mean if you control the BIOS, you control the system. And we will show how, how it's, Possibly to uh, attack VMM with uh, some uh, specific rootkit for ECMM. And Yuri, we will continue with rootkit. Yeah, if I'm not trip, if if I won't trip, uh, you know, over this cable. Uh, so um, okay, so the, the the one of the the first thing before we actually go into trying to attack hypervisor from within the virtual machines using firmware. Uh, why would anyone do that? Yeah. Well, one of the impacts is well, install a uh, rootkit into the firmware and get persistence, get full stealth, get well what we think or what you might think after the presentation, full control over the hypervisors or and all of the virtual machines. But you know, before we started that, we kind of found that picture. But uh, and 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 uh, what do you think? Where are the kitties? And where, who who is the kitty and who is the lion? No guess? Okay, our guess was the kitty is the rootkit and the hypervisor, so those kind of things that um, you know, monstrous uh, completely you know, protecting everything from uh, you know, from, uh, from uh, uh, including those kind of things like uh, rootkit. Um, so we'll see how that, how, how that goes. So what is firmware rootkit? In a really kind of a very uh, high level picture, it's just something infecting the uh, system firmware. Either, uh, either BIOS or UFI firmware or, or a, a, an SMI handler which is a runtime portion of the, uh, of the BIOS executing in parallel with the hypervisor OS. Uh, or it could be uh, something else like, uh, I don't know, core boot or some other kind of a software architecture of the firmware. So, uh, when and, and you can see the, the, the you can see the arrow on the left of the uh, of the slide the the privileges of the exploit compromising each portion uh, on that picture uh, increases with going down the stack and it's pretty uh, kind of a you know familiar concept if you compromise something within the VM you cannot compromise other VMs or hypervisors if you have, if you compromise hypervisor you can you can control the VMs but you you cannot really compromise firmware uh, and so on but if you can compromise firmware you control hypervisor and on, uh, everything on top of it. So that's kind of a, you know, uh, the, the idea of the slide. Uh, however, this is not how we've actually implemented that because the rootkit, one of the uh, one of the goals of the rootkit is stay stealthy and persistent so that nobody uh, gets the get, gets uh, out of the firmware and nobody can detect, can detect it. So, um, so we we took a different strategy rather than can, uh, you know rootkit compromising hypervisor you know, overriding its code and so on it's uh, it might be detectable uh and it's not that kind of a, it's more difficult because we don't know hypervisors we do, we don't know how to modify them right so uh so what we did instead assume there's a attacker vm uh, the vm that's controlled by the attacker completely and somehow on that system and we'll explain how but somehow on that system rootkit got installed into the firmware so instead of actually uh, kind of overriding hypervisor or installing your own hypervisor or anything like that, so we 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 <coughs> implemented a backdoor. Uh, we did a very uh, small modification to the data structures. Um, no modification to the code. I'll explain how we modify data structures, but um, you know, kind of the the ultimate is ultimately we've uh, we we can implement multiple uh, kind of strategies for the rootkit, and in fact, one of the strategies is one bit modification, and that one bit mo modification basically gives attacker VM full control over everything going on in the system, including the hypervisor. Uh, so we, we we will have a demo. The, the demo uses a slightly different approach. So um, I'll explain it on the next slide. Uh, so through that back door, we don't modify anything, any code. We install that back door through a data structure and then that back door provides full access to one specific particular VM to all other VMs, including to the hypervisor itself. So uh, how that particular, our particular back, uh, back door works. So uh, um, when rootkit is on the system, every time the system boots, 
It starts you know, as part of the firmware. Uh, in fact, we've been using uh, kind of runtime uh, part of the firmware, which uh, periodically scans the memory. So the rootkit scans, scans memory, finds virtual uh, kind of a virtual control uh, blocks or virtual control structures for uh, uh, for the uh, for, uh, for the uh, virtual machines. Um, you know, finds the one that uh, belongs to our attacker VM, and then from that point on, it finds the uh, kind of a, the, the pointer to the hardware-assisted page tables that Alex talked about. The, the page tables that actually translate the guest physical addresses to the host physical addresses, and modifies those page tables by just a adding a few entries. And those entries, you can see them. Uh, uh, over there, uh, so they basically map on you know uh, they map all of the DRAM starting from zero to uh, the physical address starting from uh, 256 gigabytes. So at at, at the at, at, at 256 gigabyte uh, um, um, boundary, our attacker VM will have full access to the DRAM, to uh, all of the other VMs, to the VMM itself, uh, and everything else. Uh, and basically that's, uh, you know, I had actually balloons <laughs> describing what I just described, right? Uh, so the rootkit added a page table, a page table entries to the page table and now attacker VM has full access to all of the memory. So uh, before uh, we show you the, that demo, uh, how would uh, one install the, uh, the rootkit in the firmware? First method is what Dino calls a uh, border guard attack. It's basically when somebody sticks Something to your laptop when you you know leave it, like for example this uh, uh, you know spy flash programmer, and physically overwrites the firmware on the spy flash. That's kind of nice, yeah. But uh, you know, you can, you, you, sometimes you can see that somebody uh, you know broke your laptop apart. Uh, sometimes you cannot. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know the easy mechanism would be if uh, if the firmware is not properly protected, it's uh, protecting itself on the spy flash on the ROM, then, uh, the, then you know, booting into a malicious USB uh, and basically running a code that will reflash your firmware, that's an easier mechanism, kind of like better USB or something. You can use other uh, ways with a physical access to infect the system. In fact, uh, Trammell and, uh, and Zeno showed um, um, yesterday how to use, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, add on, uh, um, add on uh, uh, adapters uh, to infect the, the firmware. Uh, so there are other mechanisms with a physical access. But firmware rootkit could, could be installed uh, using a uh, software mechanism, right? If, uh, for example, if the firmware is not adequately right protecting itself in the flash memory, you don't need physical access at all. You you need to have a uh, kind of a, a, a an attack, a software attack that can flash uh, whatever it wants on, on, on the on, on the spy flash memory. Uh, it could be done from privileged guest, for example, DOM zero or root partition, uh, because uh, all of them you know provide some direct access to the system firmware. Uh, um, you know, for for that you would need either a direct exploit to the privileged guest, or you need privilege escalation from normal guest to the to the privileged guest. Uh, it could be done from uh, the host OS in the hosted virtualization uh, scenario. Uh, you, you could, uh, you know, one could install a rootkit before even the hypervisor is there, or in parallel with the hypervisor. Uh, or uh, you know, hypothetically, it could be done from a normal guest if. Uh, the VMM provides a direct access to uh, uh, one of the system firmware interfaces to the normal guest, right? So there are software mechanisms uh, to install a rootkit. So and now uh, let me just uh, show you the demo of the rootkit before we go into the exploitation part. Uh, so uh, we will we will use uh, Hyper-V. Can you see that? Okay. So we'll use Hyper-V, but this rootkit is VMM agnostic. It will work against any VMM. So it's broken in two parts. Demo is broken in two parts. This is the first part where we install the rootkit. And we're using the fact that this system particularly doesn't properly protect its, its own firmware. So we're just bypassing the firmware protection and installing something on the flash. And this could be done like months before the, the, this, you know, rebooting the server. Uh, it could be done like I showed with a physical access, with a USB stick, or with a spy program, or something like that. So it's a, it was the first part. Now we rebooted that server. Uh, so we have uh, we have three virtual machines here. Two of these uh, are victim machines. One of them runs Ubuntu, the other one runs Windows, and we have a third machine which is a attacker virtual machine. It runs Windows. So first we will uh, 
open a Ubuntu virtual machine, it has an Apache installed in it. Uh, and so what, what we'll do is we'll actually generate a, a, a public-private key pair, um, including the public certificate for Apache, for HTTPS, and uh, that's what I will do in a, in a second. And bear with me, because uh, uh, I was made to type this whole open SSL command line. Uh, you know, not from history, but like literally type it. Uh, three lines. Okay, so we're generating, we're, we're generating X509 certificates and private key, RSA private key for, um, for our Apache. So the um, the private part, uh, you can see RSA 2048 bits. That about right, right. Uh, so the private the pri private key will uh, will be dumped into into that SSL cert snake oil dot key file, um, and the public part will 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 get written to uh, SSL cert snake oil dot pem. Uh, so we're issuing a uh, certificate. We're requesting to issue a certificate for victim corp. Uh, registered in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, with no emails. Now, uh, um, I'll, I'll just bring uh, bring up the config file, and you can see that those uh, private and public key uh, keys are uh, um, are um, you know used in Apache. Now let's restart Apache. Uh, so the server is up. It's using those keys. You know, HTTPS is, is enabled to the server, to the web server. Uh, now I'll, I'll just bring it, uh, bring the private portion of the RSA key on the di on the display. So this is all uh, that the victim corp did on that virtual machine. Now uh, we'll open a uh, uh, virtual machine with Windows. And the only thing we'll do there, we have uh, kind of a you know confidential documents over there on on on, uh, on that virtual machine. Uh, two confidential documents. One of them is uh, annual earnings of some corporation, which is apparently confidential for uh, I don't know what, what reason. Uh, the uh, second document is um, product schedule of the same corporation, and it's super top secret. A little bit more confidential. So the only thing we did is just view those documents. Uh, and now we'll go to uh, um, uh, the attacker's VM uh, running Windows. Remember, this system just got, you know, a couple of minutes ago, that, that system got rootkit installed in the firmware. So rootkit is now, uh, you know, um, working, running, uh, doing its thing, opening a back door to the attacker VM. So in attacker VM, uh, I'll tell you a secret. Now it has full access to all the memory. So what we do is we just run a script that dumps and searches for uh, you know some secret, secret artifacts in that memory. And we're searching for pub private keys. We're searching for uh, kind of the documents, like RTF document docs, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, give it a minute. It found RTF documents in memory somewhere. Uh, saved it to a file. Um, found a few of those. Found RSA private key, SSH key, key blob by the way, not ours. Um, some encrypted private keys and so on. It, it actually finds a whole bunch of stuff, not even the, the ones that we generated. So uh, the, the, the script is done. It dumped all those found ar artifacts into, um, in, in, into, into a folder. Now let's search for confidential, files that have confidential. And here we go. So we've, we found, blank document? Okay, we found annual earnings confidential documents that somebody opened in a completely different VM. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No. you. You have to stay at least uh, until top, super top, top secret. 
So uh, we're, n we're now looking for a super top secret. And we found that super top, se top secret document as well. And so finally, uh, we're looking for um, a private key blob. There are quite a few private key blobs extracted from memory. And one of them is, uh, is basically our RSA private key. And uh, just uh, to compare those, you could compare those offline. You know, the, the video will be available offline. So uh, the, those, those will be two keys. So uh, bottom line, we had a completely persistent rootkit, uh, completely stealthy. And nobody uh, from within the view virtual machines, including the administrative virtual machines right, like root partition in this Hyper-V, uh, is able to uh, find it there. Uh, and the rootkit is uh, VMM agnostic, so um, you install any VM, uh, any VMM, and it will get the same results. Like even it, it won't even notice which VMM is installed because we we're not even using uh, any of the artifacts of a, any specific VMM. So uh, now we're switching. Um, I'm switching to full screen. Bear with me, a second. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so we flashed that rootkit uh, in, in directly into the firmware image from within the root, root partition. Uh, and this is, this is because the system didn't properly protect the firmware. But more systems started you know, protecting the, those, doing those basic uh, uh, protections like uh, right, you know, enabling write protection of the firmware in the spy flash. Uh, you can test with the chipset with that specific module common.bios underscore WP. Uh, by the way, you have chipset on all the uh, DEF CON CDs, uh, thanks to uh, DEF CON team and, and Lost uh, especially for that. So, uh, so you, you can, you can you know, grab chipset out of there and test if your system uh, you know, uh, is repeatable like that. Uh, but you know, uh, what, what, what would the attacker do if the systems properly protect uh, their biases and uh, UFI firmware? Uh, well, we've explained a whole bunch of attacks that you know, a whole bunch of vulnerabilities in the pre uh, you know, in the previous presentation at Recon uh, that could be used uh, for those purposes. So you could install uh, a rootkit uh, uh, using uh, either uh, you know using those vulnerabilities as well, and we'll uh, we'll discuss two of those. But before we, we we'll go to discuss two of those vulnerabilities, so a couple of words about what this rootkit could do. Um, in fact, it's um, you know the the, the rootkit has access to, provides access to the attacker VM to all the memory. And from that memory, that attacker VM can extract VMCS structures or VMCB structures, uh, extended page tables or nested page tables, so hardware assisted page tables, can extract uh, host page tables for, uh, for the hypervisor, guest page tables for each of the guests. It can ex extract all of the page tables for IOMMU units, for all of the units, for all the hardware. Uh, it could extract the memory map including a VM exit handler as well as it can extract full configuration of all of the real hardware devices, including PCI configuration registers, MYA registers, and so on. So uh, this is one example. So we're, we're basically extracting from just memory, we're extracting all the extended page tables with, uh, which gives us all of the kind of a memory map, the translation from the guest physical addresses to the host physical addresses. Now with that, uh, let's go to the section that explains how we uh, would, how the attacker would uh, exploit hypervisors from within the virtual machines. And all of those attacks that we'll describe here, um, uh, they are done from the uh, privileged administrative position, so specifically a root partition or DOM zero. Uh, so. Um, um, you, you know, but uh, we, we the, the, the kind of uh, the full version of the slides that are published right now, uh, it has uh, a little bit more details, including you know, including vulnerabilities from within the normal guests and so on. So, uh, um, uh, with that, I'm uh, tr tr uh, transitioning to Andrew. He'll uh, he'll walk you through the attacks. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, what uh, for? Turn it on. It's off. Okay. Right, it's on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's better. So, what poor attacker can do if he finds that uh, a spy flash is properly protected? So, he can try another thing. Uh, there is a small piece of code that handles a uh, uh, 
system management interrupts in uh, SMI handlers. And SMI handler uh, accepts parameters in uh, general purpose registers. The parameters can be pointers, and uh, SMI handler reads and writes data uh, using these pointers. So, and if the pointer I is not checked, it can write or read from SMRAM itself. So if that uh, attacker can generate SMI and supply a pointer in, uh, into S SMRAM, SMI handler will do write or read for, uh, for the attacker. So the attacker is a privileged, uh, isn't privileged root partition. So it, and he, uh, if he or she can uh, uh, generate SM, uh, uh, SMI from uh, uh, from the kernel, from ring zero. Yeah. It will go to SMI handler, and SMI handler will write to hypervisor memory. Like this. It can modify the code, the data, like you mentioned, it, it can modify uh, page table structures, open a backdoor, or uh, drop a piece of code that will overwrite a spy flash for us. Um, now we have a demo. Second demo. It's a uh, uh, Hyper-E as well. Mm. Uh, this way uh, runs the exploit. From the root partition. So right, yeah. right now the exploit yeah. is compromising SMI handler from within the root partition. Yep. Launching the second part of the exploit with. And now we're trying, yeah, we're, we're trying to find uh, uh, control structures in hypervisor memory. So we're in a virtual machine analyzer that will find this for us and show this on the screen. So it, as you can see, it found, uh, it found uh, three virtual machines, including a uh, red partition itself. So we have a uh, complete access to the uh, uh, hypervisor memory so we can. Do whatever we, we want with it. Uh, so, how is this possible? Uh, the problem is that uh, VMM configures uh, uh, IO bitmap, so it allows uh, a privileged guest to generate uh, uh, to access uh, to several ports, and one of the open port is B2 port, which we can use. Uh, to generate a uh, system management and interrupt. As you can see, the IOMAP ports uh, <laughs> that cause the VM exit are uh, circled with red. So the, uh, the access only to these ports will, co uh, uh, will be caught by uh, VMM. Or other accesses uh, 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 to other ports will not be seen by uh, VMM. So this way, we can generate uh, system management interrupt and uh, hypervisor will not see it. So this is uh, a firmware issue, right? So uh, the problem is that uh, hypervisor does, uh, doesn't check the pointers that supply to. Oh, the the SMI handler doesn't check the pointers supplied to it. But what if the uh, uh, SMI handler? Is implemented correctly, and it checks the, that the pointer is not in SMRAM because it's the only thing that uh, it, it can does. It, it, it can do uh, because he knows where the SMRAM, but he has no idea of the virtual uh, uh, the, uh, uh, hyper uh, wiser mem memory partition and where is the uh, hypervisor memory and where is the uh, virtual machine memory. So we st uh, the attacker can steal a uh, supply pointer 
uh, uh, pointing somewhere in physical memory, and this memory can be hi uh, hypervisor memory. And SMI will still, uh, SMI handler will, will still write data to uh, this memory because it's outside of uh, SMRAM. So from the point of view of SMI handler, it's completely legal operation. So this, uh, in this case, the attack will look like this. So attacker uh, generate S uh, SMI with, uh, and SMI handler will compromise the hypervisor. So SMI uh, handler writes uh, data or writes data or uh, code in uh, VMM and opens a backdoor. It's awesome. Mm. Do you want to? Yep. So, uh, <coughs> thanks, Andrew. Uh, so basically, uh, that was the uh, one of the attacks applicable to uh, Hyper-V uh, because of the fact that um, yeah, because of the fact that uh, root partition has full access to all the I/O ports, including the software SMI I/O port, which is B2. So it could trigger a vulnerability in, in the SMI handler, and this way. Uh, you know, propagate the attack onto the um, uh, onto the hypervisor. Next, we'll show a completely different issue, which was uh, uh, discovered by multiple folks, including uh, multiple teams, uh, including um, including our team, uh, as well as Rafal from Bromium and uh, and uh, researchers from Legba Core. Um, this is vul this vulnerability is uh, known as a S3 resume boot script vulnerability, um, and. Uh, 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 Trammel and, Leg and Zeno uh, used it in uh, Thunder Strike 2 attack as well uh, on Max yesterday. So we'll use that attack. Uh, so the first, first, uh, I need to explain a little bit of uh, the kind of uh, you know background of what S3 is. You know, uh, you, you know most of the systems, especially kind of laptops, desktops, and so on, they support the sleep state or suspended RAM, where uh, you know you, you you put the system into sleep and it's and it's resumed. And that, that happens much faster than you boot the system, and that, 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 that's the purpose, right? The, the contents in the memory are preserved uh, when you're resuming the sleep system from sleep. Um, and so what happens with a firmware? When firmware normally boots, it executes a whole bunch of code. Uh, if it's a UFI-specific firmware uh, or base firmware, then it's, it's executing hundreds of uh, so-called firmware Dixit drivers. Each of them configures uh, something within the hardware, some device and, or, or so, like writing certain registers. So it's a lot of time, and uh, we need to, you know, conserve that time. Thank you. So uh, the, the way it's done, uh, it, those drivers record their actions. In addition to um, uh, configuring hardware, they record their actions into a uh, structure called resume boot script table, and this structure is just in the memory. Uh, well, on many systems. So when uh, you put the system into sleep and resume from sleep, uh, the the firmware doesn't execute all of that, uh, you know, code all of those drivers. In fact, what it does, it loads a kind of a, the, the the executable module, firmware module that interprets the boot script table. So which reads the, the the those actions that have been previously recorded on a normal boot, interprets them, and this way restores all of the hardware configuration on the system. That saves you a whole bunch of time. Uh, that is why you, we can resume like in in seconds and so on. So. Uh, but a little bit, a uh, few words about what this boot script table is. It's just a sequence of opcodes. Each opcode can write specific re hardware register, either PCI config register or a memory map I/O register or a memory location or I/O port. Uh, so this particular screenshot it shows you that uh, the the, the opcode is writing to memory. In fact, the ba judging based on the address, uh, that's a kind of a, a memory mapped I/O or memory map configuration register. Uh, but there are other opcodes because you know sometimes you it, it's not sufficient to just write to the register. Sometimes firmware needs to do a little bit more, you know, more complex action. And for those kind of types of things, there is a dispatch up code that basically just uh, uh, you know invokes arbitrary code. So what could go wrong? Uh, first of all, the, the vulnerability is uh, d you know described in um, great details by uh, in, in the white paper we referenced, as well as in the publications by Corey uh, and Rafal. Uh, so. First, uh, how that applies to attacking hypervisor. So um, we will attack Zen from DOM0 uh, because uh, Zen does not prevent uh, DOM0 uh, access to the S3 boot script table. Well, apparently because just you know VMMs don't know about that boot script table. That's a firmware thing, right? So 
so the, 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 assume there is an exploit within the DOM zero. This, this exploit just goes and modifies the contents of memory. Uh, it modifies that S3 boot script table, installs additional opcodes, modifies existing opcodes, or, or, or something like that. And uh, you know, then puts system into sleep. And when system resumes from sleep, sleep, the firmware uh, uh, you know interprets the completely you know, bogus uh, attacker boot script table. And you know, including uh, you know, executing a breach of code. Uh, this is done on uh, with the firmware privileges. Therefore, um, uh, therefore, that code can modify hypervisor at will. So basically, you, you've got some compromise here. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you the demo uh, on um, exploiting uh, Xen from DOM zero using this vulnerability. Uh, I just. Um, let's just see that we're in DOM zero. Using Zen, and we have Ubuntu guest, Ubuntu virtual machine. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm launching a command uh, that just uh, you know searches memory for hypervisor structures. Structures you, you saw that in structures VMCS, extended page tables, and so on. Basically, structures hypervisor wants to protect. They guarantee hypervisor protection. So and and, and the script couldn't find anything. Because you know you, you 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 generally none of the guests have access to those critical structures, including the privileged guests like DOM zero or root partition. They cannot. Now, in, so uh, to uh, kind of solve that problem, we're launching an exploit. Right? We're launching an exploit by modifying S3 boot script table in memory, which we uh, have access to. Uh, we installed some uh, opcodes into that boot script table. Then we're putting the system into sleep with RTC wake, and it will take us a couple couple of seconds to wake from sleep. So now we're we're uh, we're awake. System is uh, is up and running again, and we're launching the same script that you know uh, looks for those critical structures of the hypervisor, VMCS structures and uh, and APT page tables. And we found one. So basically, we have full access to the structures controlling controlling virtual machine for that Ubuntu guest. Uh, so okay, uh, that does look a little bit familiar for those of you who followed ITL research from a few years ago. They did, you know, they did explain that hey, it's possible to blue pill the hypervisor through the BIOS, right, or through the MBR, and pretty much those attacks, you know, kind of uh, get to the point that yes. You can you can you can compromise hypervisors completely using those vulnerabilities in the in the BIOS or in the firmware. So, uh, but those vulnerabilities were from privileged guests like root partition and DOM zero, which sort of sort of limits the impact in the minds of a lot of people, right? Um, minus the privilege escalations from uh, from the normal guest to the privileged guest, right? Or or directly root you know exploit into the root partition. So, what about the, the, the cases uh, that? Strictly want to separate guests from uh, root partition, and uh, we 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 heard a presentation uh, by folks from Microsoft on the new virtualization-based security model in Windows 10, which is basically that model. So right now we are working with Microsoft to make sure that those are not uh, kind of uh, applicable to uh, uh, the Windows 10. So tools and mitigations that we have. First of all, first thing first things first. If you have Vulnerabilities in the firmware, you're in trouble. Uh, you can you can have thunderstrike, you know, infection. You you, you can have uh, you know, completely persistent and stealthy rootkit. You can uh, compromise. You know, you can attack full disk encryption based on TPM. You can attack secure boot. Uh, you can, as we saw, you can completely control the hypervisors and every every secrets within every VM. So we need to fix those vulnerabilities, of course. And uh, there are uh, there are tests in the, in the open source uh, chipset framework that you can run and test for both issues that we've explained. If your systems are vulnerable as well as uh, you can test if the firmware is right protected uh, on the spy flash. But you can uh, we, we also need to test hypervisors and especially all of those uh, hardware and firmware interfaces that the hypervisor is exposed to the VMs. And uh, we'll be releasing open source modules to the chipset that test pretty much every every hardware interface like all, uh, MSR emulation, IO port emulation, uh, CPID emulation, MMIO emulation, and so on. 
uh, as well as we'll provide, a, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll release some of the additional functionality in the chipset that just allows you to uh, see how um, you know, VMMs are uh, built and uh, debug them and so on. So, uh, but how do we deal with uh, you know, the, the, the firmware attacks and the hypervisors? First, a number of interfaces uh, exist that could be used to attack firmware. Variables, SMI handlers, S3 boot scrape, direct spy, spy flash writes, and so on. And uh, unfortunately, firmware doesn't know what hypervisor wants to protect. It doesn't know all those pages that the hypervisor is protecting. So the firmware cannot validate, uh, you know, the hey that the pointer I just got is really pointing to some hyper obscure hypervisor memory. I cannot validate that. The firmware cannot validate that. So both firmware, it, it's so that that that, that just. Uh, uh, you know, demonstrates the point that um, it's not just the firmware problem. It is both firmware and hypervisor problem. Both VMM and the firmware have to be designed such that they are aware of each other, of each, uh, you know, its own interfaces and, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, some of those interfaces should not be even exposed. Like, for example, uh, Zen doesn't expose uh, directly SMI handlers to the even DOM0, right? So some of those interfaces have to, should not be even exposed. But some interfaces, uh, you know, may, uh, may, may, may need to be trapped and, uh, and emulated by the hypervisor. So the conclusions. Because um, we have uh, a couple of minutes. Um, first, compromised firmware is definitely bad news for VMM. And that line and the kitty picture, it pretty much, you, you know, we now know that the line is the firmware rootkit. It's not the hypervisor. So uh, the firmware needs to be tested for issues. With Windows 10, uh, there is a path to a direct uh, update of the firmware through the Windows update, which, will, which uh, uh, should streamline updates of the firmware with vulnerabilities and so on, uh, with fixes for the vulnerabilities. Uh, with new vulnerabilities as well, of course. So uh, make sure that your privileged guests are really secure and really hardened. Because privileged guests, as we saw, because of those uh, you know, expo exposed interfaces to the firmware, they pretty much control the hypervisor uh, on a uh, uh, you know, majority of the systems. Uh, they, the pre your DOM zero is pretty much the hypervisor, root partition is pretty much the hypervisor because of those uh, vulnerabilities. So the vulnerabilities in the device and CPU emulation are very common, so we need to pause the interfaces for those. And uh, um, you know, we, we, we've seen high profile vulnerabilities recently like Venom and so on, and uh, our team found quite a few of those uh, uh, in, the, uh, you know, in, the, in the device emulation. So those are pretty common and pretty well understood. But uh, you know, they, 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 they need to, you know, the hypervisors need to be fuzzed for those vulnerabilities. Now the firmware uh, interfaces and features may affect hypervisors if they are exposed to the guests. Uh, so both VMMs and firmware need to be designed such that they are aware of each other. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you, you saw uh, Andrew describing SMI handler attacks. The, the demo that we did, it actually compromises SMI handler first. Basically it overrides SMM firmware and then that malicious payload within the SMM compromises hypervisor. So this is a firmware problem. But even if the firmware SMI handler validates that the pointer uh, supplied to it doesn't point to its own memory, so you cannot really get SMM code execution through that vulnerability, you can still tell the SMI handler, hey, here's a pointer, points inside a VMM page writes to it something and it will write uh, on your behalf. So basically you are using firmware as a confused deputy or as a proxy to proxy the attack onto the hypervisor. And it's a big, and, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a significant point because it, you know, it proves that this is not just the firmware problem. It's also a hypervisor, and, you know, both hypervisor and firmware problem. So with that, uh, we're basically concluding. There are some references, including uh, you know details to the white papers explaining all of the technical information about all, you know vulnerabilities that we've uh, we've used. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I appreciate very much you staying until Sunday and until our talk. Thank you.